welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 196, featuring part two of my interview with Richard Garriott, aka Lord British, aka the J.R.R. Tolkien of our generation. This part of the interview, we talk about the origins of Ultima, Calabeth, why Richard loves the Apple II, and much, much more. Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Lord British. So, Richard, you got your start right at the dawn of the home computer industry. Uh, and I use the, you know, I teach a video game studies course and I had well, to explain I, kind of like, what is a home computer? What does that mean? And I'd say, well, you needed that back then because you had to make sure you, people knew you weren't talking about these sort of living room size uh, machines, right? Yeah, exactly. So and, can you put me back in your, your shoes at the time? I mean, what, what got you into programming and designing and uh, all the work that you needed to, uh, to put into place to be able to make a Calabeth world do? Yes. Now, you know, uh, I was here shuffling papers beside me to look for some props for some of these uh, earliest days. I still have the spools of paper tape sitting somewhere around me of, of those earliest uh, games. But for me, it, it, if I really go back to the, really what the root of it all is, it really goes back to Halloween uh, and something specific about Halloween. Uh, when I was a young trick-or-treater one time going around the block, I went to one of my neighbor's, neighbor's houses and this woman had decorated the entry hall of her home like a little witch's chamber. And uh, she herself was, of course, also in costume. And she made you come in and she had all kinds of high-tech uh, electrostatic shock machines and things. You had to literally get shocks by to even come in before she would reach out and touch you with this little Tesla coil kind of thing to grab the candy. And it was, it was the closest thing to being really immersed in a virtual world of scariness that you know, I'd ever seen. And I began immediately after that to start manifesting my own. Not only haunted houses, but I'd do them year-round. Easter, 4th of July, it didn't matter. I was building these interactive things for my friends to come over and go through. Um, that, uh, the, the, this predates Dungeons & Dragons. It predates computers. But they were already live-action role-playing game at my house. Uh, LARPing, I suppose, before LARPing. Um, uh, then... And, and that was also before I'd ever read any fantasy. It was before I had seen Lord of the read Lord of the Rings or the Chronicles of Narnia or some other great fantasy that uh, I then latched onto. Uh, right after that is when uh, the game Dungeons and Dragons was published, and I was one of the very first adopters of that game. And what's interesting about the early days of the playing of Dungeons and Dragons was that. Um, rules were irrelevant to anyone. The rules were insufficient for, really, frankly, any game. And even to the degree the rules existed, nobody cared. Um, instead, it literally was a group of people sitting around the table doing, having an interactive narrative where when the game master would describe a scenario, as long as the rest of the participants would do something that sounded clever or funny or interesting in some way, then sure, it works. And to the degree people were doing either nothing because they don't know what to do or doing something that sounded stupid, well, guess what? It didn't work. And then the narrative would proceed. And that was, that was the beginning and end of it. And since there were no rules, the only reason it would be fun is if you had both a good storyteller at the helm and very highly participant, uh, participating um, uh, players uh, on the other side. And, uh, and so D&D, &D for me and my friends, took off in a way that you know, years later, as people began to debate you know, initiative and l angles of line of sight and all these other things. I'm going like, you know, those are just, uh, those become, you know, systems. Those become spreadsheet games again uh, compared to what I like to do, which is role playing. How well are you playing that role? And as long as you're doing a clever job of playing that role, I want you to succeed. And, um, uh, and then computers came out. But for me, you know, in 1974, um, the first computer, you know, the, the Apple II, the first personal computer, was only invented in '77. So it wasn't it wasn't a personal computer; it was a teletype. And um, and on that teletype, uh, I wrote 28 games that I called D and D one through D and D 28. Uh, prior to getting a hold of my first Apple, which I rewrote D and D 28 to D and D 28 B, which became a Calabeth. So even before, which is of course Ultima Zero, really, and the reason why I call it Ultima Zero is because it literally, you know, even though it was a standalone game, that entire game was a subroutine inside of Ultima One. The dungeon code for Ultima One was a Calabeth, and so uh, then plus Tile Graphic Outdoors uh, just replaced the Outdoors with Tile Graphics, 
And so, um, uh, 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 you know, long before Ultima, I really was already writing the the same game history um, with the same kind of gameplay ideals, with the same storytelling ideals uh, that go back uh, into the early 1970s. Is there a place that people can go if they want to play uh, these D and D early uh, one through twenty eight? You know, it's it's hilarious. Funny you should ask because D and D one, you know, which is you know here in this here in this notebook, um, uh, I wrote in AppleSoft Basic, so a very specific basic. And and on my iPhone, I found a few basics the other day and downloaded them. And this D and D one has fifteen hundred lines of code in basic. You know, and you know that's maybe 20 pages or so, but, you know, I can retype 20 pages, so I've already been studying little graphics commands on these little basics on my iPhone uh, to see if next time I'm flying on an airplane I might uh, try to type one of these in. Uh, but the problem I'm having next is that none of these allow you to export that file, so I couldn't share it with anybody. Uh, so I'm still looking for how uh, I can wrap up D&D 1 into a modern uh, uh, envelope so that I can share it with people. But under the assumption I can figure out how to do that, then um, you know maybe I'll, I'll I'll sneak that into maybe one of the levels of our Kickstarter. I'll give you a running copy of my personally reprogrammed D and D number one. That'd be completely awesome. I was wondering, uh, you know, all these early uh, Dungeons and Dragons sessions with your friends. How many of those scenarios and characters ended up in the games? Oh, another great question. So. Uh, it, to be honest, I didn't even know the answer to that question until recently. Uh, well, because I must have known at the time I did it, but I, I long since had forgotten. And um, and while I, I I couldn't find an actual map, because there's still there's still a way that if I go when I go back through my scenarios that for that I did for D and D campaigns, they still differ in one really important way from the scenarios we've actually managed to program on computers, which is why I still think pen and paper gaming is cool. Um, universally, my pen and paper campaigns, um, you know, if you, were, if you were going into a wizard's tower or an orc colony, you know, that dungeon, I'll use the orc colony as a case study, was really drawn out very logically. You know, there was a way and a method by how they blocked their front door. They had, you know, they immediately then had guard rooms. You know, behind that, uh, they had the barracks and mess halls. Behind that, they had their, you know, prisoner holding areas and their torture devices. I mean, it had a logical flow to it, which is one thing I liked about going back to look at my old campaigns. But they had another part that we've still never mastered in computer gaming very well, which is there were a lot of very custom... Uh, uh, portals to get past, gateways to get past. You know, like I was looking through one the other day and it was like, you know, there's a big door with a pentagram on the front and empty spots for colored gems in the door, you know, uh, holes. And you had to go find all these pieces and put them all the right together in the right way. Um, when in, and if you're describing that verbally, it's really easy to say it. And it's really easy to say, well, the red gem's over there, yellow gem's over there. And, and in a computer game, it's not easy, it's pretty easy to hide a gem here and there too. But to make a door that you had to slot all these things into and then the door would open based on if you had the right things in it uh, is a pretty custom piece of code. And it's for one use, for one moment in the entire scenario. And so my D&D campaigns were full of moment after moment after moment after moment after moment of these very custom little puzzles um, that are very difficult to execute uh, cost-effectively in a computer game. And so it's something I'm literally reading right now of my own long historical work trying to go, okay, you know, there was still something special about the D&D campaigns I I put together when I was younger. How can I capture some of this? You're also a big, by the way, do you say Tolkien or Tolkien? Uh, Let's see, how do I say Tolkien? I say Tolkien, Tolkien. not Tolkien. That's the way I say it, too. So I know you're also a big fan of J.R.R. Tolkien. So I want to talk a bit about him. And I was. Uh, this is kind of a thought that occurred to me as I was thinking about this. So, if if he was uh, around today, uh, my guess is he'd probably be making games uh, since he'd like to create his own worlds in, in such lush detail. Uh, so, you know, I just kind of like to hear you talk about Tolkien a little bit. Also, do you consider yourself to be our generation's J.R.R. Tolkien? Well, boy, that would be. Uh, if, if anybody were to ever think that, I would uh, be thrilled to have that association made by all means. Um, but, uh, 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 but the skill of writing a great book and the skill of writing a great game, I think, 
have some important differences. And so it's uh, hard to know. I, I definitely could not do what he did with, with the written word. There's just no chance. Uh, you know, it's interesting. My, uh, you know, I'm a, such a student of Tolkien, though, that that my my wife, who is uh, less of a student, I have her well fooled. I mean, she actually thinks I could go write a book that was as you know. She recently, I, I recently showed her all the Lord of the Rings movies and things. She hadn't, she'd never read the books, and she's going like, "I know you could do that, Richard." And I'm going like, "Well, yeah, I'd love to, but I actually don't think I can." Uh, but on the other hand, there is something about my development methods that I believe I learned or gleaned from my study of his work that I really have no idea if this is how he worked. And as I've compared now notes with other game designers down through the years and more recently with other writers, I don't know anybody else that does this. And, uh, and I don't know if I have one of these notebooks here right beside me at the moment. Oh, I do. Um, but for example, here, this, this is the development notebook for Ultima VI. Uh, and so these are my notes that I put together during the development of Ultima 6. And uh, what's interesting about the way I work, and by the way, I started this process back when I wrote the story that became Ultima in high school. So back on the story of Mondain the Wizard, the very back few pages of this, or this appendix, has the same, what I'll call, format that every other Ultima I've written, how I format my own notes. And, and I think that is how I develop the stories and keep these notes and work with these notes is a key to my success. Um, and let me go back first again to, to Tolkien and to tell you how I gleaned this or how I came up with this idea, inspired at least by the results of, of what he came up with. You know, when, when you read your first Tolkien, it becomes obvious to you that all of the ruins that you, they go by had a, his, had a real history. You know, because it's not it's not just arbitrary that you find the uh, you know the three ogres in the woods who were turned to stone uh, when you read Lord of the Rings that you know that in fact in The Hobbit you see those ogres that were turned to stone, and while you might be uh, you know fighting against the Shadow Lords in the ruins of some citadel, uh, you can then go back to the Silmarillion and read the story that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote about that citadel you know in, of ages past that and how it became a ruin. Um, and after I read all that, I then started going back and saying, well, when you read about Tolkien's own inspiration, he was inspired by oral histories of the Scandinavian people, in particular, a, a series of, of now written, but originally oral traditions known as the Kalevala. So I went back and I bought the Kalevala, translated in English, and read through all those as well. And so when I read all that, I actually went, wow, at least for me, Keeping all that information, first of all, I became devoted to doing that much backstory. And then I said, for me to even keep that much backstory straight requires it not to be in a linear medium. It requires it sort of be, to be in a, a multi-axis spreadsheet. But there were, of course, no spreadsheets at the time. But I began to create these appendix to my story that was, every time I thought of a character, I would you know, I'd have a character on one page of the appendix. The character in what was special about them, what things they were carrying, what they did, etc. Just but organized just by character, almost alphabet. If I had to rewrite it, it would have been alphabetic. But it's just the character. So I ended up like, what do I have for that guy? I can always flip to his page. Then I'd have another one which was threaded by town. So the geography of the world. I'd, I'd, and I'd put the names of each person or that was in there, or the name of a magic artifact that it was found there or lost there. But the whole the whole story was rethreaded by town. And then another page would be. Um, you know, as I'm naming new places or objects, I would put the name here to go and how I came up with it. Like, you know, why did this person get this name or what kind of is it? Am I using Latin roots for these? Am I giving characters their name based upon the, uh, the aesthetics of their region? You know, what's, what's the logic by which I'm driving the naming system? And so all these appendixes were, were ways to subdivide the story from each thread, each uh, angle. And then I would write the, the main story up front. The, so the first main body was the story in what I'll call character progression uh, in, the, in the order that a player might experience it. Um, but since, again, you can go anywhere you want, at any time you want, you, the appendix was actually, if anything, more important than the uh, linear threading of what a player might experience in my one example of, 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 a, of a full threading. And I still do that to this day. And, uh, and it's interesting, I, I had Warren Spector of my office the other day, and I asked him the question of, you know, this is how I work. Have you ever seen anybody do this? And he's going, no chance. He said, I know lots of writers, no writer does that. I've known lots of game developers, no game developer does that. He said, not only that, but he said, when I was interviewing at Origin, 
and you showed me the Ultima 5 binders, uh, he thinks it was at the time when I, w- I was working on that threading. He said, that's how I knew you were heads and shoulders ahead of any other person doing game design is because you're the only person I've seen before or since who does this. And by the way, I already have that for now for Shroud of the, for, uh, Sh- uh, Shroud of the Avatar. I already have my, my multi-threaded binder in progress. And you've gone so far as to create your own language and runic systems too. Oh yeah, and well, it, and and all of these things. If you think about the virtues, I was never a student of philosophy in school. But as soon as I realized I needed to be uh, to, to speak about philosophy, I went and bought an entire research library on the subject and read it thoroughly to become a reasonable expert on the subject. Um, as soon as I said, "Gee, I want to have," um, well, the, the original runic was really the the druidic runes, the same as Tolkien used. I mean, well, pretty much precisely. Now, still, in fact, we'll be using those again in Shroud of the Avatar since they're what I'll call traditional in a sense. Um, but when I go to invent completely new languages, like I've done three or four times now, and we'll be doing it again for Shroud of the Avatar, I, you know, you go uh, like, for example, I really like the um, the pictographic system in Tabula Rasa there behind you. Uh, because you can actually read it. You know, if, if you think about runic, runic is great if you speak English because it's just, you know, there's another, there's another symbol for the letter A, another symbol for the letter B, and a separate symbol for the letter C. But if you're trying to speak Japanese or, you know, German, you first have to take the runic into English and then the English into your native language. Whereas something that's pictographic is literally has the exact same meaning no matter what language you speak since it's ideograms or thoughtgrams. Um, you know, so when I knew I wanted to make something that aliens would have left behind in order to let people of Earth decipher it, a, a meaning gram, a thought gram was clearly appropriate. And so, but I, but I had never done any studies of hieroglyphics or other forms of pictographic writing. And um, so, you know, I went and bought a bunch of books on the subject, quickly realized how, how and why Egyptian hieroglyphs took so long to be translated because they're not pictograms, they're audiograms of sorts. Um, um, uh, and then, you know, eventually found enough schools of thought and modern work that people have done for communication with handicapped uh, uh, children, for example. People have put together some really great pictographic languages. And so I just began to pull from modern sources till I found one that was workable uh, for what my needs were in a game. Well, you said your first PC uh, was the Apple II, is that correct? Uh, I've talked to a lot of uh, designers and developers on, on this show, and they've talked too about how much they love the Apple II and how, you know, how influential of a machine it was. I'm just wondering, what, what's your take on why this platform played such a vital role in the, the careers of so many uh, aspiring young game designers, such as yourself? Well, it, it is interesting because um, uh, I think the beauty, one of the many beauties of the Apple II, was uh, was, was its simplicity. Um, the uh, you know, the, the, the 6502 processor, which was common in a lot of these early machines, or, or even its competitor, the Z80, for example, and they generally could only address in total with their two bytes, uh, two byte uh, uh, word size, you know, you can address, you know, 64K of, of, of address space. Uh, and that generally meant 48K of RAM to store your programs in and 16K of ROM to store the entire operating system in. And by the way, 16K wouldn't even remotely hold one iPhone picture. You know, so in where, uh, in fact, 64K wouldn't either. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I think a nominal iPhone picture when I send it, even after it's compressed as a JPEG, you know, is two or three megabytes. And so it's, it, it's stunning to think how truly tiny the, these machines were in the sense of address space. And so if you think about the address space that was predefined, the, the ROM, and some addresses which were physically pieces of hardware. I mean, there was a physical address which was the speaker. And so, you know, you put a one to that address, the speaker is up. You put a zero to the address, the speaker is down. So by changing one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, you vibrate the speaker at whatever vol- you know, rate you want to make sound. And, uh, and there were so few variables, it really was a lot more like Tinker Toys in the sense of you could really get your head around every single solitary address. There was no one of those 16,000 addresses that I didn't have some reasonable familiarity with, and many of them you know, uh, great operational knowledge. And so uh, uh, it allowed you to do things or to, man- to manually manipulate the machine in ways that it was never intended. Um, for example... Uh, this, you know, I was writing in BASIC, as I'd mentioned, 
And in Ultima 1, and a Calabeth for that matter, um, the basic language was never meant to be, uh, to have like a, uh, you know, a, a, the fundamental part of the program and then say which monsters were available to be copied back off of disk to replace the new monster set from this level. Because the number of monsters I wanted to show in the game was greater than would fit in memory. And so I actually had to write a routine that would save out the binary of the last half of, of the program I wrote in BASIC, load in the new binary of the other monsters I wanted to show. The program better not, if I ever debug the program and change the length of the program, I would screw up the, this point of which this had to be copied in. And then I had to move the end of file marker manually to line up again uh, so that it could... That so it didn't notice so the 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 the, pro, the 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 software didn't notice that I had cheated by copying uh, a new second half of my program into memory, and these were things that were there was no book that ever told me how to do that. There was there was no there, not only was it not officially handled, it was officially not you know done uh, within the operating system. But the reason why I could do it was just because the machine was simple enough. You're going like okay, well I I see how it's working. I'll bet I can cheat. And uh, and make a paginated um, basic program uh, by these hacks that uh, we could do to get past what the original design of the machine was. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I will be back in two weeks uh, with the uh, third and final part of this interview with uh, Richard Garriott, so stay tuned. Uh, next week, though, I will be in Frostburg, Maryland for the Computers and Writing Conference there. Should be there from about Wednesday to Sunday, so if any of you guys happen to live around Frostburg, Maryland, uh, shoot me an email or a YouTube comment or something. We'll get together for a ale in person. It'd uh, be fun to meet some of you guys. Uh, if you, either way, though, I uh, really appreciate it, guys. Uh, if you uh, support the show, uh, donate to the channel. You can do that at armchairarcade.com. Just look for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner of the page. You can uh, a dollar a week, a dollar a month, uh, guys, whatever amount that you feel comfortable with. I greatly appreciate it, and thank you very much. Now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week I've got a little number here from the Red Hook Brewery, which I actually had the pleasure of uh, visiting. It's uh, somewhere around Seattle. I went there with my brother-in-law. Uh, brother uh, this is their seasonal series, a Wise Cracker Viet. Looks like wit. <laughs> uh, it is kind of a witty little phrase here on the bottle. Wheat, wheat beer brewed with ginger, but still digs Mary Ann. Uh, so I hope you guys get that uh, reference. It's... 5.3% alcohol by volume, so a little bit stronger than a Budweiser, but uh, not by much. But anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this wise cracker Viet here in the old, rather excellent drinking horn. I'm trying to think of a few wise cracks of my own. I'm not having much luck, and I don't think this is going to help. I'm not really smelling that ginger they talked about. Uh, Maybe a little bit of a peachy, kind of citrusy smell, not unusual for a, a, a wheat ale. Anyway, let's go ahead and give this a taste. Ah! And that's an interesting taste. It's not usually as light as a... Actually, it's kind of got that, uh, that sort of soggy cornflakes-like flavor you get from a Budweiser with a little bit of a hint of something like Blue Moon on top. Uh, not a very good ale so far. I, I'll give it another try. Ah! Now this is, it's kind of got some, uh, some body to it, I guess. It's uh, kind of a darker tasting uh, wheat than I would have. Again, it's not like any other wheat ale I've tried. It's more like a... Uh, I really don't know how to classify this. Um, not a very good choice. Uh, a little too much like a, a, Bud, a Budweiser, uh, in my opinion. Matter of fact, I'm not even certain I could tell the difference between this and, and a Budweiser. So I'm going to go uh, one out of five drinking hordes on this. Uh, just not uh, very impressive and definitely uh, not as good as the other Red Hook ales that I've tried. When I was there, they had a, a special... A tripel or triple, a Belgian triple style that was just phenomenal. And I was really wondering why they never put that in the bottles and sold it. But 
Uh, I guess only only they know the secret to that. If they would ever release that, it would definitely be on my uh, top five list. Anyway, let's uh, wrap this up with a quotation. And the quotation comes from J.R.R. Tolkien, of course. And I, I thought it was very uh, uh, very appropriate for this, this, this interview. Fantasy is escapist, and that is its glory. If soldiers are imprisoned, don't we consider it their duty to escape? If we value the freedom of mind and soul, if we're partisans of liberty, then it's our duty to escape and to take as many with us as we can. I thought that quotation was really appropriate for this interview with Lord British. Probably done more to help more of us escape than any other man. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's it for this week's episode, and see you guys two weeks from now. Qui vous êtes conçu